Welcome to the live stream. Today, we're going to be addressing some questions about government jobs, about usajobs.gov, and anything pertaining to federal government jobs in order to help you move closer to attaining a government job. So first, I'm going to answer some questions that were already submitted. After that, I will then focus on the chat to see if we have any questions in there. So the first question that we have is from Tyler Simmons 6614, who asks, how do I know if my job is requiring a secret clearance or just a public trust? So there's a few ways to know. First thing is during the, the background check process, you will be asked to either fill out an SF-85 or an SF-86. SF-85 is for public trust. SF-86 is for an actual clearance, either a secret or a top secret. That's one way that you can find out. Another way that you can find out is if you look at the job announcement and you scroll down, let's go ahead and take a look at that right now. So if you scroll down to the right-hand side over here, you should be able to see under security clearance, you see here it says secret. This would say other. And then you have position sensitivity and risk. This would probably be low or moderate or medium risk. And then you have trust determination process. So you wanna look at these three sections right here in order to, to try to figure it out. Another way that you can do this is if you contact a human resource specialist and you can ask them, you can ask them what level of background is required for this position. Now you have to keep in mind that time is gonna be a huge factor depending on which clearance or which public trust you're trying to to uh, apply for. So a top secret obviously is gonna take a lot longer than if you're just trying to get a low risk public trust position. Okay, so the next question is from Joy Hinden 7389 who asked, can you apply for a job asking for a master's degree but you have a bachelor's degree? Can you bend the rules? So you cannot bend the rules, but I wanna make a distinction between job announcements. You will have some job announcements that say you qualify on education only for, let's say, a GS9 with a master's degree. This doesn't mean that you need a master's degree. This means that if you had no experience, the only way that you would be eligible for this position is if you qualified on education only, which is a master's degree. You can have no degree or a bachelor's or an associate degree or just a handful of credits. And you can still be found eligible and qualified for the position if you're qualifying on experience. Now, when it comes to a hardline requirement, so if you're looking at the job announcement and it specifically says you need a master's degree in order to be eligible, period, then you're going to need to have one. But I'll tell you this, if you look on usajobs.gov, it's like 10% or maybe even less of the positions actually require a master's degree. A lot, most of the positions, they don't even require a bachelor degree. There are some, like in highly specialized fields. So if you're talking about the medical field, right? If you wanna be an RN, you're probably gonna need a bachelor in science in nursing. Or let's say if you wanna be uh, a, contracting, a contracting officer, I think you need 24 semester hours in business. So there are some cases where there's hardline educational requirements, but for a lot of the jobs, I'm talking about, let's say the 0200 series, the 0300 series, 0500 series, the 1700 series, to a certain extent, these job series, they do not have a hardline education requirement. So do not get the two things confused. There are a lot of GS13s, GS14s, GS15s with no bachelor degree. So they're earning a salary of, let's say, 150, 160, even up to 180,000 a year. And the job that they have, it has no education requirement. And talking about education requirement, when you're qualifying on solely education, that only goes up to GS11. After that, you need a combination of experience to go along with the education or just experience. Hopefully that helped. Next question is from KK Love, who asks, will applying for details advance your federal career? I'm currently at a detail at my job. All right, so people who don't know what a detail is, it's a temporary assignment. It usually lasts for at least 120 days. It can go over that. And this is something that you would usually have to volunteer for if you are currently a federal government employee. 
So say you're in one office and a detail opportunity pops up in a different office, a different section within the agency. You can, and this could be even a higher grade than you. Say you're a GS-12 and there's a detail opportunity that's a GS-13. You can go and, and start doing those duties, fulfill those tasks in that capacity. Now, this is a good thing for your career in a lot of different ways. First, you're getting new experience. That's a plus. You're getting exposed and you're meeting new people. That's a plus. A lot of positions, before they hire for the position, they'll put out details and they'll see how a person is performing and then that would be an indicator. So if they open up a job position and you apply for that position, you're already a known quantity. They already know who you are. They know your work ethic, right? So if you make a good, a good impression, you start to build a good reputation, then that, can, that could have you in line for a higher level position in the future. So that's something that people do. They, they take details. Also keep in mind that with a detail, at the end of your detail, there's a write-up. There's a write-up period where you have to list your accomplishments it's kind of like a mini evaluation. So make sure you're keeping good notes throughout the detail. It's not the only way to move up, but this is something that is advantageous for a lot of people in their career. So good job for that. All right, let's look into the chat. Bobcat Stillwell. Good morning, Bobcat. Nice to see you back in here. Teresa Balderrama, hello. I have a question from Matt. Matt Mittens. My question is, I have a history of temporary WG, which is wage grade, full-time work I did in the early 90s, periodically. I would, autom I would get automatically promoted to WG 5, 8, 10. That ended. If I got hired now, if I got hired now, okay, this extends on to another. Okay, would that history carry forward in benefit or points or any advantages full-time permanent civil service, that is, I was in the Air National Guard. Um, yes, well, obviously, all of that experience, that experience is going to transfer over. When you when you put it into your resume, it's going to, it still counts. It's, you said it was in the 90s, so that was the early 90s, so that's that was a ways away, that was a while ago. You can still put it on your resume if it's pertinent to upcoming jobs. Now, as far as applying to government jobs now, this is a, a WG position. I don't believe this was in the competitive service. So you would have to kind of start back, start back at square one when it comes to applying and trying to get into it. But you do have some air national guard time. I don't know if you have a deployment that would make a difference. So your situation is a little bit more nuanced, but you can use that experience. If you have an SF 50, when you apply, attach the SF-50, or once you get into the job, hand the SF-50 to the human resource specialist. They'll be able to do some calculations. If you have any, any type of, um, any type of like, let's say your leave accrual rate, or, or if, you're, if you were on FERS, I, don't, I think maybe you were on CRSCS at that time. So if you were to get back into the government, I would definitely hand your old SF-50 to the human resource specialist, see what they can do for you. Um, okay, another question from Mary Parker. I get referred and no calls, callbacks. What do I need to do differently? I do not have military experience. So Mary, there's different hiring paths aside from being a veteran. One thing you could do, you're not a veteran. If you do not want to compete against veterans, you can look at direct hire authority. Type in the search bar for usajobs.gov, type in direct hire, look at those job positions, filter it through your location and see if there's any direct hire positions. That way you don't have to worry about veterans um, bumping you off the best qualified list. That's one thing. Another thing is that you can, I don't know when's the last time you were in university, you could do a 12 month college program that would give you recent student graduate preference. So you can get into the government that way. If you have any disabilities, you can get a Schedule A letter. You can get through that way. If you don't have any of those or you're not willing to go back to school, you can still compete for open to the public positions. And it's really going to come down to your resume. So you get referred. And what gets you referred is a strong resume. So that's great. But then for the second step, which is actually getting called for interview, you have to compete against everyone who was highly qualified or everybody who was best qualified. So it comes back again to your resume. How is your resume standing out? Is it competitive at that higher level? If you're not getting called for an interview, that could be one of the reasons why, among other reasons. But I would encourage you to, con to continue, make some small improvements on your resume and to stay persistent. Look at maybe some other pathways, focus on the direct hire path. All right.
Next question is from John. Is there a conflict of interest if I keep working on my government contracting business? I mean, it could be. It depends. It would really depend on what type of government job you're getting. Is it, I mean, are you getting a WG position? Is it in the Department of Defense? What agency is it? So a lot of things come into this. Is something that I would still apply. If government employment interests you, I would apply. And then at a, at a certain point, you're going to have to bring this type of question up to human resources and see, you know, if, if uh, management has an issue with it or not. Good morning, Grouse of the House. Good morning, Daniel L. Good morning. Thank you for being here. All right. Let's get back to the questions. Next question is from Brianna Bella Amy, 6176, who asks, advice to college graduates seeking a career in government. So once again, I would encourage anybody who's a current student looking to graduate, or maybe they already graduated, look at the recent student pathway. Look at the student pathway. Let's take a look at it right now. Let's see. Share my screen. Okay. So recent student pathway. Look, right now, down here, we see for students, it's 165 today. This is right now. And then for recent student graduate, this is 196. This is positions nationwide. Now, if you're a current student, these are going to be internship opportunities. And not all of them are paid. I would say a little more than half of them are paid. So you would have to look through there and see what applies in your situation, your location. Recent student graduates, um, all of those are paid their own salary, usually from GS7. It could be GS9. It could even be GS6. Maybe some of them are GS11. So look through there. Once you graduate, whether it's a certificate, an associate degree, if it is a bachelor degree, a master's, it doesn't matter what the degree is. As long as it's accredited, there's a website a government website that you go to to type in your school name and you can verify whether that school is accredited. If it is accredited, whatever education program that you have completed, that would make you eligible for the recent student pathway for 24 months. Now, if you're a veteran, it extends further than that. But if you're not a veteran, 24 months. In that period, you can apply for recent student graduate. So that's what I would do. And I would also encourage anybody who's in school right now, if you're in college or university, try to volunteer. And you can use that experience on your resume. Volunteer, even your minimum wage jobs or your lower paying jobs that you're taking as a student, put that on your resume too. Don't just put education, unless that's all you have. If you have other type of experiences like volunteering or a lower paid job, put that experience on there. And another thing I wanna say about this is, your degree, your certification, whatever your the major that you have, the studies that you're focused on, it does not have to be directly related to that, the job. So I know one lady, for instance, she had a bachelor's in public administration. She used that to get into the recent student graduate pathway for a 0560, which is a budget analyst. So her degree was in public administration, and she was able to get a finance type job essentially, in the government. So just because, you, let's say you majored in history, don't let that you know deter you from actually using the recent student pathway. Okay, hopefully that helped. And let's go to the next question. Next question comes from Tyler Simmons, 6614, who asks, what do they mean when it comes to appointment type? Permanent, federal. Okay. In the government, there's two main categories. You have permanent positions and then you have temporary positions. Under permanent, there's two other categories. There's actually more than two, but the two that I want to focus on is conditional. You have conditional competitive service and then you have career. So conditional means that's pretty much everybody when they first get into the government, you're conditional because you have to go through a probation period. So in order to move from conditional to career, which is uh, both of them are permanent types, so you would need to complete your probation period. So that's usually 12 months. It could be 24 months, depending on the agency. So knock out those 12 months. And then you would need to have three years in the competitive service. After your, after your 36 month mark, you would transition from conditional to career. And then you would be permanent career. And that would essentially give you tenure. They call it tenure. Because do let's say this, hypothetically, you do three years in the government and then you get out and you get into the private sector. You do private sector four or five years. 
After that, you have tenure in the government, so you can apply at any, any given point, and you can apply directly to the competitive service. And what that means is you have way more opportunities that are open to you, that you can actually apply. So the jobs that only government employees can apply to, you can apply to, and it's because you have tenure. Um, so that's what that means. Next question comes from Miss T YouTube, who asks, I was wondering if you would be able to do a video comparing competitive service versus selective service jobs. Okay. I can, yeah, I can definitely try to do a video on that. But when it comes down to services in the federal government, you have three. You have competitive service, you have accepted service, and you have senior executive service. So I think the question, and I might be wrong, but I believe the question is asking me the difference between competitive service and accepted service. With competitive service, there are rules that have come down from Congress that OPM mandates all agencies follow. These rules, the intent is for it to be fair, open competition. So in competitive service, everyone is on an even playing field, so to speak. Everyone has to follow the rules. In accepted service, it's not like that. The agency makes up their own rules. And it also lends people to hire people non-competitively. So an example of this would be for the, for the veterans, right? So VRA, Veteran Recruitment Authority, that would be a non-competitive hire. Schedule A is a non-competitive hire. So those would be on the accepted service. Now, the accepted service, those positions can sometimes they can turn into competitive. So if you had a job, Schedule A, you get a job with Schedule A for 24 months, you're on accepted service. But after 24 months, that position transforms or changes into the competitive service. And most people are trying to get into the competitive service because as I mentioned earlier, it opens up so many more opportunities to you. It allows you to have tenure. There's a lot of people that they'll spend 20 years in the accepted service and then they try to apply to another government job and they don't, they don't have any tenure, so they don't have any preference. They're not able to apply to a, they can only apply to open to the public or other accepted service positions. Now, this might not be the case if you have an interagency agreement. If you have an interagency agreement, let's say the post office, for example, that's accepted service. So if somebody from the post office wanted to get into, let's say, Department of Justice, I think there's an interagency agreement that would allow that person to get in. Otherwise, you would be stuck, you know, applying to the open to the public positions. So something to keep in mind. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the chat. Is, okay, new wave 2239. Good morning. Is a Schedule A quicker to get into the VA or, or direct hire as a disabled veteran? As a disabled veteran, well, first off, the VA loves hiring veterans. I was in the VA. And the VA is made up of really close to 50%. You know, the Department of Veteran Affairs is one of the biggest federal agencies underneath the Department of Defense. I think the DOD is higher. The Department of Homeland Security might be, you know, up there in the top three. Department of Veteran Affairs is huge. And half of them, half of the employees are veterans, which is good. And it can also be bad, you know, because they, being that they're veterans, a lot of them take the military jargon and they kind of use it in that agency. So if you're not into military culture, it might be a turnoff. So as far as what will get you hired quicker, Schedule A is great. And uh, using your disability uh, as far as being a veteran is great too. It would depend. But what I would suggest to you is reach out to the Schedule A coordinator for the Department of Veteran Affairs. You can, there's a website, you can find their point of contact information. You can email them today with your resume, your DD-214 and your SF-15. I would do that. I would take the approach of the Schedule A, interact directly with the coordinator for, for the VA. And then also there is a veteran coordinator for the VA. Now, I think if you email them, you might get an automated message right now. A lot of agencies actually have a real person when you email them. You would have to go to vet, uh, fedshirevets.gov. And if you go on there, you would find an email address. You could do the same thing with that. You can email your DD-214, your SF-15, and your resume. So I would approach it from two different angles for you, okay? But it looks pretty good. If you're a disabled veteran trying to get into the VA, I would say it looks pretty good. LMAC, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Tierra. 
Barnes. Good morning, Tierra. Hi, thank you, Armand, for your great videos. Thank you for watching. Thank every, everybody who's ever watched a video of mine. I really appreciate all of you. The question is, I accepted GS14 job offer with ICE. I have been cleared background, but I'm waiting on a top security, top security, uh, top secret security clearance. My EOD is August. Any tips on interview? So this is a little confusing because they gave you an EOD. So you have an entry on duty date, which means you're going to start working in August. So you're asking me for tips on an interview. It seems like you went through the interview process in order to get the background check, in order to get your EOD. Um, I have a lot of videos on interviewing. Oh, I think maybe you're asking me with the top secret, the interview that comes with the top secret clearance. The only advice I would have for you, if that's the case, if not, correct me. Be honest, be very, you know, be confident, calm, and honest. So, you know, sometimes they're, with the interview, if you've never sat through an interview for a top secret, they can look kind of skeptical, right? Because they're prodding. They're trying to figure out if you're honest, what's going on with your character? Is there anything that's questionable? So just be open and honest with them. I think I have a video on security clearances that talk, talks a little bit more about that if you're interested. Um, another question from CR. To get tenure, do you have to stay in that job for three years? You do not have to stay in that particular job. You don't have to stay in that agency. You just need to be in the federal government under the competitive service. So you could do two years in the Department of Veteran Affairs, jump over to the Department of Agriculture and do another 12 months. And then boom, three years, you have your tenure. It can work like that. Usually when you're transferring between agencies, they transfer your SF-50 from one HR department to, the, to another HR department. So all of that should, you know, nothing should be lost in, tra in transition. Okay. Next question. Anna Ban. Thank you for joining me, Anna. Should you put bullet points on the resume? That's one way to do it. You don't have to. With the resume, you have a lot of flexibility. There's two ways to do the federal resume. You do one on usajobs.gov resume builder, and it's okay to do that if you want to. I mean, that's a good way to make sure you don't miss anything. Also, there are certain agencies that require that format, like the Coast Guard and like the FAA. And then there's a couple of others. I prefer to upload my own document. You have more control over the style and format and how you want it to look. So bullet points, for my preferred way of creating a resume, I do use some bullet points. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it can highlight certain areas, but this is kind of subjective. So there is no right or wrong answer with this. But if you want to, then go ahead and do that. Um, okay, so Dixon... Yerma, good morning. Hua, <laughs> good morning, Top. Can a veteran can a veteran hired through VRA get tenure anyway in the accepted service? So most of the time, when you're hired through VRA, that position will convert. You are not going to stay in the accepted accepted service unless it's just an accepted service type job. Most agencies use VRA to bring you on board. And then your service will convert after 24 months without any issues. You're still doing your job. Everything's moving along fine. Now, there are some positions, like look at, look at the Department of Justice. There are so many sub-agencies under the Department of Justice that are just accepted service. And some of them have to be. If you look at the CIA, the FBI, the ATF, the Border Patrol, Border Patrol is under DHS. But some of these have their own hiring process. They have their own uh, selection, screening, their own tests. So for the, there will always be accepted. If you want to be a CIA C, uh, special agent, you're going to be accepted service. So, um, but to answer your question directly, a veteran hired through VRA, they can get tenure, um, but it has to be through competitive service. If you're in an accepted service, uh, accepted service position, it will convert after 24 months, and then that count that time will, will still count. So you do two years in, so you get appointed through VRA. Let's say you get to the Veteran Affairs, you do two years. It's a competitive service job, but currently it's under accepted because they used VRA to bring you on board. You still need to do another year and then you would, you should have tenure. Okay. All right. Another question. Change your socks by veteran Paul Anderson. Good morning, Paul. Thanks again for the phone call. Uh, before the DOT, the Department of Transportation interview, 
I'm still waiting to hear back, but I think I got this one. I did really well in the Navy JAG admin officer interview, and I should hear back. Hey, that's great. Uh, it was nice speaking with you. And hey, I hope I, I hope you get that one right. I think I think you're gonna you're probably gonna pull that one through. That's good. Um, next question, Dixon Yerma. Can veterans use active time? If you mean active duty time, then no, you cannot. Active duty time is not going to count. Next question. That's not a question. <laughs> um, okay, question. Dixon Yerma, have you ever heard of disability veteran sick pay? Yes, there is certain leave that's, that is uh, allowed for disability. If you're a disabled vet and you come on board to an agency, you have extra hours allocated for your appointments related to your disability. That does exist. I believe there's like a 24-month time period where, where you have to use that, though. So definitely take advantage of that. All right, one more question. Christopher Wheeler, good morning, Chris. Good morning. I've received an offer for RN care manager position with the VA, and the manager said she would direct hire me. That's great. Could you explain the next steps? Thank you. Okay. Direct hire. This is a medical position, right? RN care manager. A lot of these type positions can fall under their direct hire authority. The human resource, the next step for you, I would maintain contact. If you are in contact with the uh, the hiring manager, definitely maintain that contact. The next step would, would be HR contacting you. HR would contact you. They would have a whole list of It'd be, uh, the email would have like 12 documents on it, something like that. You'll have a lot of documents to fill out. And that's kind of the, the initial stages of the onboarding process. And you're going to have to go through the whole background, check the fingerprints, the picture, all of that stuff. Um, now, I would, you know, I would have to look at the job announcement and see exactly you know, what's, the, what's the security. Is it going to be like a high-risk position or not? I don't think it would be in your situation. This is probably for the VHA, so it, it should be pretty timely. Um, but yeah, once again, it, it depends on a lot of different factors, but it's good that if she's, it's one thing to say that you're going to use direct hire authority. The key indicator that this is actually happening is when HR reaches out to you. If you don't, if HR doesn't reach out to you in a couple of weeks, I would keep, I would email that manager and say, hey, you know, <laughs> what's the status? Should I be expecting a call or an email from somebody? So maintain that communication. Um, CR, if you already have a top secret, if you already have a top secret clearance, how long will it take to get SCI or SCI polygraph? All right. So this is, this is a little bit of an unfortunate one because when, if you have a secret clearance and you're going to another agency, let's say you're in the military, you have a top secret clearance in the military and you're going to the department of Homeland security, the agency wants to redo your, they're going to want to do their own clearance. And this doesn't seem very smart, right? It seems like a waste of money. Why would these agencies keep redoing their clearances? But this has been happening recently a lot where you jump agencies or you go from active duty military and then you try to get into the, the federal government as a civilian and they're redoing the clearances. So if they're redoing the whole thing, you're looking at six months. Now, it's going to help that you already have a clearance, right? Um, but it's going to come down to how backed up is that security office? Half of the weight for security clearance is because you're in a in a huge log. You know your paperwork is waiting. They do it based off priority sometimes. You could be waiting for weeks if they're really backed up. Um, so I don't know. In this case, I would say six months. I would assume that they're going to redo this whole thing. And it depends. Again, this is polygraph, right? So are they going to do lifestyle? Maybe they won't do lifestyle. If it's just polygraph, you know they have to do an appointment for that. I would just plan for six months. And then I would also see, can you do anything with an interim clearance? Are they going to let you get paid with an interim? Or are you? is this what you're waiting on before you can start earning a paycheck? That's another big question. All right. Um, next question. Manita Barry, good morning. After one year of probationary period with one agency, does that one year count when transferring to another agency? Meaning, do you need only... Do you only need two more years at that new agency to get tenure? Yes. If I understand your question correctly, if you do 12 months, even in the probationary period, so in one agency, and then you jump to another agency, you do two more years, you, you're going to have the three years that you need in order to get tenure. So, yes. 
Okay, next question is from Torin Porti. I hope I, hopefully I said that right. How long do you have to be a GS9 position before you're eligible for a higher grade? 12 months, that's it. Any day that you're spending over 12 months, you don't need to be there, right? There are some people that are that know, hey, I am, a, I am a GS14 caliber type of individual. I have the experience and I can get there. But for whatever reason, because of their geographical circumstances, they, they get a GS12, right? So they take lower than they should, which I don't recommend. But they know that they're taking a pay cut and they're trying to get to GS14 as quick as they can. In that case, after 12 months, they're applying to somewhere else. 12, so if you start applying at the 12 month mark, it could take another four to six months to get the job. So realistically, you're looking at 18 months. If you're GS6 now, you do 12 months, you start applying on your 12th month, and then six months after that, you should be a GS7. And then from GS7, usually you skip GS8, so you go straight to GS9. So another 12 months, you start applying for GS9. Now, you don't have to go through these steps chronologically if you have previous experience outside of the government. So if you have 10, 15 years of private sector experience that's applicable, you can apply to open to the public jobs and compete with your old experience. So for some reason, if you made the mistake of trying to get your foot in the door and you're now a GS6 and you know you should be a GS13, that is what that's that's one way I would I would uh, rectify that. Okay. Next question. Mick Empire, Mick. Good morning. With a not qualified email is received, but it doesn't have HR email included to ask why you were not qualified. What email can I use to contact them? More times than not. They're not going to tell you. Sometimes they will, but most of the time they're not going to tell you why they're qualified. And the reason for this is they do not want to open themselves up to any type of legal action. So if they say the wrong thing, it could be viewed as discriminatory or it could be viewed as illegal. And then all of a sudden now you might try to file a lawsuit. So for that reason, a lot of people, they don't tell you why you weren't qualified. If you have any questions regarding the job, the best place to look if you were interviewed for the job, uh, contact the person who scheduled your interview. If you were not interviewed, then I would scroll all the way down on the job announcement, look for the point of contact. Sometimes that's a real person. Sometimes it's a call center. So <laughs> it's kind of like a 50-50. I would look down at the job announcement and see if there's an actual person you can contact and ask those questions to. All right. Um, next question. Tyler Simmons. Good morning, Tyler. Is it normal for agencies to have you take your PIV before clearance is finished to have you take your PIV? So um, PIV is a personal identity verification card. If you're not in the government, it's a, it's, a, it's a card. It's an ID card. It has your picture on it. You can use it to get into your federal building and you can use it to access your federal government computer. So that's the significance of a PIV. Now, usually they give you one, let's say on your EOD, your, your first day of work or the first week of work, they would typically give you your PIV card. And for them to give you that, they would have to do an initial background check. Now it's not a public trust. You don't have to fill out the SF-85 or the 86. It's just an initial background check takes three to five days. If you pass that, they would give you your PIV. Now, if something were to go wrong with your background check, say if you're, you're applying for a secret clearance and, you're, and it falls through, or you're applying for a public trust and for whatever reason, you don't, you're not eligible to hold a public trust, they're not going to ask you for your PIV back, but you wouldn't be qualified for the job anymore. So all the functions that the PIV does, it wouldn't do anymore. So it would be like a souvenir. In fact, there are some people who leave their federal agencies and the agency doesn't even ask for the PIV back. So they end up having a souvenir back at their house and they just hold on to it or they throw it away. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, here we go. College motivation. I like that name. I keep getting referrals and no interviews, not sure what's happening. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're not getting interviews, it, it comes down to your resume. If you're getting referred, then you have a strong resume. If you're not getting interviews, then your resume isn't strong enough to compete against the higher level category. So let's say you have a job opening. HR looks at, let's say the top 20%. There's different categories. There's not qualified, there's qualified, there's highly qualified, and then there's best qualified. So I don't know what bucket you're going into. Maybe you're going into the highly qualified bucket, which is fine. So you have highly qualified and best qualified. 
Then for the interview, you're going to have to compete once again. Who Who's the standout candidate? And then whoever that person is, they get the interview. So I would say that you're not standing out probably because of your resume. It could be other reasons too. You could have preference individuals knocking you off. Um, let's say you have veterans or Schedule A or something else that's knocking you off. That could be the case. But if it's happening, I don't know how many times it's happening. If it happens, let's say more than a few dozen times, then I would relook at your resume. All right, let's see. Next question. Can you negotiate? This is from Grouse of the House. I like that name too. Can you negotiate a higher step on a pathway recent graduate offer? I've heard some departments are strict on step one only for these positions. The, the technical answer, yeah, you, you can negotiate step, but you're right. This is agency dependent. And it's for not just recent graduates, it's for everybody. Every agency has it within their ability to negotiate step. Now, we don't know what their budget is or what they want to do. Like maybe the, the guidance from management is there's no step negotiation. But I tell you what, if it's a highly competitive, if it's a position that is in urgent need, so we're talking about, let's say, IT specialists, we're talking about registered nurses, we're talking about cybersecurity professionals it, or attorneys. If it's a highly need position, I can almost guarantee they're going to negotiate with you. But if it's a position where they have like five or six excellent candidates right behind you, they extended you the job offer, but they have three or four other best qualified candidates, they might just move ahead depending on what their budget is. And it also depends on how you're asking for the step. There's a whole letter, that there's a memo that you can fill out that um, you can ask in a compelling way, showcasing your experience and your education on why you are a superior qualified candidate and why you should get that step increase. All right, let's go back to the questions. Okay. Next question is from Nancy GT. And she asks, I applied to two different VA jobs and I got referred and I got two referred in waiting. So she applied to two jobs. She got two referred. The position closed and then opened up again for three or four months. I applied again while waiting on the referred jobs, which is the same job the most current application one came back that I did not qualify. Why, if I'm referred for the same previous job that I, okay, so why, basically she's asking, why was she referred for one and the same job posted up and she's not referred? And the answer to this is, so when the job first came up, the competition was different. So you were found highly qualified or best qualified for the old position three or four months ago. But the competitors were different. Maybe, they, maybe the competition wasn't as strong and you got referred. So that same job can be posted today. And then now there's other competitors that are stronger than you. Maybe there's five, six, 10 different people that actually have stronger credentials than you have. So you're not getting referred. So just because you were referred a few months ago for the exact same position, it's going to come down to what the competition was on why you're not referred now. So I know that's kind of tough to hear for a lot of people, but it, that could be the case. Um, also, when, when, it, when the HR is evaluating your, your job application, they typically will assign points up to 100. So sometimes some of you might have seen this in your inbox. You will get a notification saying that you have 90 points or it'll say you're referred and then in brackets, it'll say 90 or 95 or 100. So 100 means best qualified. Now, if you put veteran preference on top of this, there's a plus five and a plus 10. So if you're a 30% disabled veteran, you could have 110 points out of 100. So that's one of the benefits of applying as a veteran, as long as it's not a direct hire position. Okay. Let's see. Next question is from Sonia Locks 7705, who asked, do WG workers get COLA? WG is weight grade. And it's usually people that are focused in the trades. It falls under the FWS, which is the federal wage system. The reason I don't talk about WG very much is because 70% 
of people in the government, they fall under the GS scale. Now there's over a dozen pay bands, but 70% fall under GS scale. Now, when it comes to WG, there is a pay survey done periodically. And when I say periodically, I mean about two or three years. Maybe it could be done before then. But based on what similar professionals are earning in that area, that's what they're going to base your pay off. So you can get cost of living increases. But it's not like a GS employee. And that's one of the frustrations a lot of people have in the FWS in the wage grade positions. They do not see that, you know, January 1st, if you're a GS employee, January 1st, you see your pay raise if we get one, right? So you'll see at least 1%. Sometime, last year, you know, it was it was higher. Um, you'll see that percent January 1st, it'll kick in. So that first pay period in January, you get that. WG employees, that's not always the case. All right. Next question. Well, let's take a look at the chat real quick. Okay, good. Chat is good. All right. Next question comes from Joy Hidden 7389. How hard or easy is it to get an overseas job, nursing, social work position as a civilian? Well, let's go ahead and take a look right now. Let's take a look at that right now. So when it comes to when it comes to uh, overseas, there's a few there's a few locations I look at right away, and that is um, Japan, Italy, Germany, and South Korea. So here we have it: Italy, Germany, Japan, South Korea. The reason I put those in there is because we have military bases in there, so there tends to be more government jobs in those uh, those countries. Looking at nurses, practical nurse, and also social work, we see that there's nine positions here. So I went ahead and I took away all the remote work positions. So these are actually in-country positions. And what you'll notice, you see this icon here that's blue? It's light blue and it has three people silhouetted. This is open to everybody. If these jobs were easier to fill, then they would be competitive service or they would be internal hires, but they're not. They're open to the public. So we have a substance abuse social worker right here, open to the public. You could, you know, if you have the right background, you can apply to that. That's South Korea, if you wanted to go to South Korea. Here's a nurse in Germany, uh, open to the public. Most of these are open to the public. We have Germany, Germany. We have Japan, substance abuse clinical counselor. So I would encourage you, if you have the right background, to, to start formatting and targeting your resume towards these job series and apply in one of these countries. Now there's also positions in Spain and there's also positions in a lot of different countries. I'm not sure where do you wanna be in the world, but um, it comes down to really creating a strong job filter so you can identify these positions. I, I mean, I talk to a lot of people that they don't really have a strong job filter. They're just searching, you know, periodically searching. Maybe they type Japan in one day and the next day they type something else in. But they don't, they don't take the time to build a really strong and robust job filter saved search so that they can be notified when these type of positions come up. So here we go, Japan social worker. Um, this one right here is open to pretty much everybody. It looks like everybody except for open to public, unless there's another job announcement that covers it. So most of them are open to the public, which means they really need somebody. And I would apply to it. It's going to be your standard process, probably four to six months before you're able to to get a to get a, the job offered and start working. But it's something to look into. Okay. All right. This looks like a mess now. Here we go. All right. Here is another question from Jeremy Clark. Any recommendations for changing agencies and how to format your resume when you do not have any direct experience in the role you're applying for? Well, Jeremy, you want to apply for positions you have re relevant experience in. That's the only way you're gonna be competitive. Now, one of the problems is people actually have experience, but they don't realize it. So, I would look at what job series are you applying for? That's one of the questions. Look at some of the job announcements for the job series in the other agencies that you're looking at. And if you sit down and think about it, look at where what you are doing now and what you have done in the past, where are the overlaps? 
the, there must be some overlaps, even if it's human resources. Let's say you're um, an administrative specialist right now and you're trying to get into human resources. There are overlaps or you're trying to get 0343. Maybe you're an instructor. You work in education your whole life. You're a 1700 job series. You're training, you're developing curriculum. That's great. And you want to apply to another job. Well, there's 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 other there's things that you do in that job position that would transfer over even for a budget analyst you're analyzing data you do the same thing when you're designing cur curriculum right you're looking at test scores and you're trying to figure out how to best design that curriculum you're analyzing that those analytical skills would cross over to budget analyst so you really have to i, I can't answer this to you exactly unless i really i have your experience if i had your experience in front of me Maybe we could, you know, come up with some sort of strategy in order for you to target these different type of job series. But I think, I believe the key here is to look for some overlap. You want to also highlight maybe some, some training certificates that you have that speak towards the new job series. If you're trying to get it into a financial management position, you want to have a couple of finance certificates. And this doesn't have to be through any kind of major accrediting body. You could do, you know, some online certificates, maybe through LinkedIn Learning or Coursera and just have something that shows that you're developing yourself into this new focus. It's gonna take some time, but it's worth it if you wanna change. All right, let's go back to some questions. Next question comes from Brianna Bell, Amy, 6176. How does a security clearance affect chances of getting a job with government and salary? Having a pre-existing security clearance is not going to make you any more eligible or any more qualified. That's going to come down to your experience and your education, primarily your experience. You will not see a salary increase solely because you have a clearance. Most people coming out of the military, they have a secret clearance. But you're not going to be able to use that or leverage it to get more money. In order to get more money, you can do step negotiation, but that's going to come down to your experience, your education. And also sometimes the amount of money you were previously earning. So if you were earning in a private, let's say you were a contractor or you worked in the private sector and you were earning 120,000 and you take a GS-11, well, you can show that with supporting documentation and, and request maybe a GS-11 step eight to get you closer. So you're not taking such a drastic pay cut. That's something that's done every day. Okay, now, now contracting, let's say you wanna get into the private sector, you wanna to go to Booz and Allen, Lockheed Martin, maybe you can use your pre-existing security clearance. That would probably have more appeal for getting into an organization like that. All right. Um, next one from Tamika1126. She asked, she would like to know more about SES. So I don't really talk about senior executive service that much. And the reason is, it's less than 1% of the government. So, but I'll go over a little bit of it right now. SES, there's five ECQs. ECQ is executive core qualifications. You, and they're the same. It doesn't matter what SES position you're applying, they're all the same. It's leading people, leading change, business, business acumen, and um, there's a couple of other ones. So you do not have to be a government employee in order to compete for an SES. You can come from the private sector. In some cases, if you're in the government already, in some cases you can be a GS-14 and compete for it. Or you can come straight out of the military. If you're a lot of, I think like uh, full bird colonels, maybe some, uh, some generals, sometimes they have the desire. Now here's the thing with SES. The pay is not gonna be that much more. So starting out with an SES position is in the DC area at least. Uh, I believe a GS-15 earns 186,000 a year. So to become an SES is a very tiny pay increase. So if you want to be an SES, the, the motivation has to be more than money. The motivation has to be, you believe because of your leadership skills that you're able to change the organization for the better, that you're able to positively influence and impact an organization to benefit the US citizens or something like that, right? It cannot be for money because the money is just not, it's not that much compared to a GS-15. Now, if you're watching me and you're a GS-6, then obviously it's a lot of money. It can go up to, I believe, 212,000 a year. Also, with their bonuses, usually it's like 10% of their paycheck. So it's not uncommon for SES at the end of the year to get a 15 to $20,000 bonus. 
which is a lot more than a regular GS type employee would get. But um, with the SES, there's no veteran preference. So that's not gonna give you any edge. And there's a mandatory re relocation clause so that if they want you to move at any point in time, you have to move. Otherwise you give up your position, you're, you're out of the job. So you had to be willing to go anywhere in the country or maybe even internationally, probably just the country. You have to be willing to relocate. A lot of people are not willing. They don't want to relocate. And the work-life balance is not the same. I was talking to a, a few GS employees this week and they were complaining about their work-life balance. But in SES, most of the time, they're really putting in the extra hours. Now, if you want to, let's say you want to pursue SES. Let's look at that for a second. If, you're, if you want to go the SES route, I'm gonna share my screen. Then this is an example of an SES position right here. It goes up 212,000 a year. Now, what I was talking about earlier, you have your, your, your uh, executive core qualifications. So one is leading change. You have to write a narrative that speaks to this. Leading people, result driven. So you're gonna write a narrative and you might be saying, well, I don't know how to write a narrative. Well, that's not a problem because OPM has you covered. OPM shows you how to write a narrative. If you go to OPM, look right here. I don't know if this is big enough for you guys. I'm gonna zoom it up. This is examples of narratives. And they use the car model, which is something that I use in the resumes I do, which is challenge, context, action, and result. This is kind of like star situation, task, action, result, kind of the same thing. But this will give you examples of an actual person that is an SES. This is how they wrote it up. There's two examples in here. So in addition to doing your narrative statements, you still have to submit your resume. It's, it's not a replacement for a resume. It's in, a, in addition to the resume. And if we go back to the job announcement, you'll see here for the narrative, they don't want it to exceed 10 pages. So, you know, let's say you do a five page uh, narrative statement for the ECQs. Then you have the MTQs, which is mandatory technical qualifications. This is like the specialized experience section. And this is no more than two pages. So, you would have to address specialized experience, which is called MTQ, and then you would still have to do the ECQs. Now, if you are a government employee already, there are programs, there are programs that you can volunteer for that will help you get ready for this whole process. One of them is called the SES Candidate Program, or excuse me, SES Candidate Development Program. You can ask HR about this. You can ask your supervisor if you're interested in this. Usually I think they target GS 14s or maybe GS 15s. They will assign you a mentor. It's like a six to eight month program and they will kind of groom you, so to speak, to take one of these positions. Now this is, keep in mind, this is career SES. This is not political appointee. A political appointee, um, they, they will be one rung higher than your career SESs, but they can also leave with the administration. So I've actually come across uh, a 30-year-old political appointee, right? So, you know, if you, have, if you have those political connections, not just SES, you can get into Schedule C, which is a lower level, you know, and, and that happens all the time. You can even apply for those if that interests you. All right, hopefully that answers your question. All right, next question is from KP99 who asked, does rejecting an offer or does rejecting an offer or department cause it to be harder to get into that? Okay, so does rejecting an offer from a department cause it cause it to be harder to get into that department in the future if you want to? So no, it doesn't make it any harder. You can reject a dozen offers from the Department of Energy and you can still apply and get into the Department of Energy. Everyone in in that agency, for the most part, human resource, they understand that you're going to do what's best for your interest. So you you and your family's interest comes first. So you could accept a job offer, start working the first week, and then just quit. And then, you know, another opportunity came where you had to move or someone got sick and you had other responsibilities. So don't worry about burning bridges in that, in that sense. I wouldn't worry about it. Just keep doing what's best for you. Next question. From Dime Peace 2473, who asked, do you still have to put in two weeks notice 
to leave federal government job, even though you've been there less than a month in training and on probation, will this affect my chances on getting another government job? You do not have to put a two week notice in. It's still somewhat considered customary in this country to do two week notice, but you don't have to. I mean, you could quit in, you know, <laughs> in a one minute notice and just say, hey, I have to go. And they will still transfer your SF-50 to the, to the next agency. This is done every day. Uh, better opportunities come up and people jump on them. So I wouldn't worry about this impacting you. Now, from your question, it doesn't seem like you have another job lined up. So I would definitely, I would hold on to your job until you have another uh, job offer, another solid firm job offer. So don't just, unless there's like some toxic things going on in your place of employment. Um, there, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot to consider in this situation. All right, next question. Oh, wait, let's take a look at the chat really quick. Question from KP. If you enjoy doing the daily task of your job and not being in management, are there no options beyond GS-11? Everything above that would require some type of supervisory or management duties. KP, that's, that's um, location dependent because I can tell you right now in D.C., in at least three agencies, there's a GS-15 non-supervisory. You can be a GS-15 and not supervise anybody. Uh, you can also be an SL, which is a senior leader that's somewhat equivalent to an SES, and you don't supervise anybody. It's like a consultant almost. So I would continue to explore opportunities, maybe within your agency or look at other agencies. There are GS-12 and 13s that are non-supervisory. Okay. Next question. Tierra Barnes. Job announcement stated it did not cover relocating expenses. Is it a good idea to take a chance and ask if they will cover expenses at the final job offer, at the final offer stage? Well, I would say there's a high probability that it's not going to offer. But if you're willing to take the job, even if they don't offer the expenses, I would say go ahead and apply and go through the process. But if you're not willing, I probably wouldn't do it. I think maybe your time is better used in other areas, maybe applying to the jobs that actually have the relocation authorization. Because sure, this could have been an HR error, but the chances are that they're not going to cover it. Let's see. Next question is from Money Cash. Based on your knowledge in the IRS, what is better for career growth, the contact role or the tax examiner role? I don't really know this, but you could do some research on your own. Look at usajobs.gov and see which one of these positions uh, exist more in the upper GS grades. So if you want to eventually become a GS 14 and 15, look at the job series and the titles and see how many opportunities exist today. That's kind of one way to do it, to look to what's out there. Other than that, you're going to have to talk to people in your agency and get there by, I've actually never worked for the IRS. I have a few people that I know that worked for the IRS. I don't have any direct experience in that agency. So you're gonna have to just do a little bit of research on your own. Uh, Grouse of the House asked a question. Can you briefly talk about a few things to consider? Advantages, disadvantages, tips concerning remote work positions in the government? Well, I think if you want remote work, it's great, right? It's competitive. It's highly competitive. You have a lot of individuals that do not live near major cities. They live in rural areas where there's not many economic opportunities. And they're kind of gravitated. If they're highly qualified, they're going to be trying to apply. So there was a position that came recently in this area, in the D.C. area. Uh, position was out for two weeks. And only three people applied. And then I looked at a remote work position. And there was over 1,000 people, 2,000 people that actually applied. So you're really going to have to be strongly qualified. You're really going to have to have a strong resume to be competitive for a lot of those remote work positions. The good part, as you know, for most of them, you can work anywhere in the country, in the United States. Any one of the 50 states is fine. You're not supposed to go overseas. So you can't work in Mexico or Ecuador or Spain or Portugal. So you have to keep it within the country. Um, but if you work great on your own, some people like to travel. Maybe they want to travel all 50 states. They want to go visit the national parks. 
you can get um, really good. There's a lot of different internet service providers. I think one of them is, is uh, Starlink where you can just have a satellite and it, it pretty much guarantees you internet connectivity throughout the majority of the country. So you can have one of those things and just get in your vehicle and go. And that could be a great life if that's something that interests you. Now, with everything, it's going to come down to your supervisor. You're talking about, you know, um, your workload, how you get along. Is there any personality conflicts? That will come down to your supervisor. And that's a mixed bag. You're not, you're not going to know what you're going to get. But I would say if you're in the least bit interested, start working on that resume. Start applying for the positions that interest you and that you're qualified for. Okay, let's look at another question from Willpower FTW, who asks, I'm in a ladder position. If there is a government pay freeze, will this impact my ability to increase to the next GS level? I don't think it'll impact your ability to get promoted. So as long as the agency that you're in, it's in their budget, you should be able to get promoted. It should not be an issue. With the pay freezes, usually what you're talking about is that at the end of the year, when we get the pay raise, that's not happening. <laughs> so there's been times where we have gotten 0%. You just don't get, and that's horrible in an inflationary environment to not get anything. I don't believe that's going to be the case. Um, the most recent article I read, I think yesterday, says that the president's 5.2% pay raise is still going into the spending bill. They're doing a draft of the spending bill right now. So hopefully we still see that 5.2% January 1st, that kicks in. Now, after that, it's anybody's guess. Uh, but I would say it would dramatically decrease. But hopefully it's something. All right, let's look at the chat. Mr. T, I've been having problems connecting with the human resources regarding an accepted offer. Any suggestions? Um, so you accepted the job offer. Okay. First thing you probably already done this. I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. The, the human resource specialist that organized the interview, reach out to them. If they're not responding when that human resource specialist reached out to you to schedule the interview, there might've been other people CC. So I would CC them or email them directly too. And if that doesn't work, if you have the contact for somebody who was on the interview board, reach out to them. If you don't have that, almost everybody has a LinkedIn profile these days. So this, <laughs> I wouldn't run and do this the first few days, but if it's been a couple of weeks, you can find that individual probably on LinkedIn. And in, in, a, in a, let's say last resort, I would message them on LinkedIn if you can't get any other way. But hey, listen, you gotta be patient still. You have to give it a week or two to see if anyone's responding to you. But if it has been more than two weeks and it's just silent, I would look at other ways to start, you know, trying to get in contact with either the, the HR specialist, somebody who was CC'd on the email, or even somebody who was on the interview. See if you can reach out to them. See what the disconnect is, especially if you already accepted the job offer. But give it some time. All right. Money Cash says, you're saying you think they're going to knock down the increase from 5.2? I would think so, yeah. I think that this is, it's kind of, when you're talking about pay raises, you have to look at inflation somewhat. And right now it's it's on the downward trend. So if inflation continues to be put under control, there's not going to be an appetite to increase the pay in 20, talking about January, 2025. And Another thing you have to consider is with the with the budget, the, the debt ceiling bill that was recently passed, they're trying to reduce the spending across the board. So I don't know the dynamic between Congress and the president talking about the 2025, not this upcoming, but the following pay raise. I could easily see it going down. I mean, I hope it doesn't, but it would make sense to me. I wouldn't be surprised if it came down from 5.2%. We'll still get the 5.2, and that's not even official, but we think it's going to happen, right? We'll still get the 5.2, hopefully. But after that, I don't think it's going to, you know, I think it's going to go down, definitely. Uh, Three-week silence? Yeah, that's that's a point of concern. I would definitely be trying other avenues in that case. All right. All right, any questions? Any more questions? All right, hey, if you need more help in any capacity, 
if you want to talk, if you want me to look at your resume, anything like that, there's a lot of links down in the description below. You can look at those links. You can access some of those links. I even have some templates there. If you're having a hard time putting your resume in a strong, coherent format, there's some examples down there for the 0343 series, the 0340 series that could help you out. There's also an interview score sheet, preparation guide, all that stuff. Resources down in the description below. Uh, there's also a course link if you want to take the course. Hey, thank you everybody for being here. It really means a lot that you guys show up. I've never had this many people. Um, so this is huge for us. Thanks. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Have a good weekend. Uh, please click like, share, subscribe. Thank you for supporting me. I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.